window. So go to View, Fit Artboard and Window. That'll, that'll bring the, the map template to full view. It's got a couple of things that are customizable. There's a north arrow. There's a scale bar, which can be modified. Um, some area here to, to build, a, build a legend. The legend. Um, you can change the fonts, that sort of thing. But it's a simple 11 by 17 template that we can start to customize. Let's see about the downloads. Uh, on the Layers tab, in current version of Creative Cloud, the Layers tab is this, this stackable layers. It looks like a little ham sandwich over there. There's a number of layers that are already pre-made pre in this. This is a, this is, I built this from an older map. So you won't need all of these layers. You can delete ones that are not pertinent and start to clean this up. Because I built this from a previous map. You won't need all of those layers, obviously. You will need things like the title block and th things of that nature, but I just I built the template off of a larger map that I had made. Go into the downloads folder. Where is the downloads folder? Where do we go? There. A few arrows. I'll drop that to my desktop. Drop the template to my desktop. So these are just a few Adobe Illustrator arrows that we can start with that, that are customizable or we can move around. We'll get to that in a moment. But we need to grab our background imagery that we'll use to, pa to pattern the information from. So to do that, we go to beaconschneidercorp.com. Beacon is a GIS viewing service. Beacon is not the only GIS viewing service. There are competitors. It's just the one that Delaware County uh, subscribes to. And let's see if I can switch over to Ball State's internet now, as opposed to running it off my phone, <laughs> which could be slow. OK, go to Indiana. And look, look for municipalities or counties that you, you're familiar with. We'll go to Delaware County, Indiana, and then we'll go to View Map. The map will load. It'll be the entire county with all of the layers turned on. That's the default view that everything will just turn on. All of the, all the information. So we're not interested in all of that. We can tur start turning off layers that we're not interested in. We don't need all of the lot dimensions. So in the left-hand column here, we'll just start turning that off. Claim dimensions, cadastral line. Leave, we can leave the parcels on for the moment to see what that brings us. You may be interested in neighborhoods, parks. We don't have any water features along our corridor. We can turn those off. Corporate, political, and you can see the option for 2019 aerial photography and 2017 aerial photography. If, if we're not interested in aerial photography, I recommend another way to look at this is, is to turn on the building footprints, which um, is right below parcels. That's another way to look at the map in a simplified fashion. Doesn't make any difference right now, but let's zoom in. <laughs> you can see each neighborhood has been highlighted, or there's a there's a clear boundary as to which neighborhood is what. If you're interested in, in the neighborhood association that has jurisdiction or political ramifications for the portion of the corridor that you're interested in, as we zoom in, you can see that text is very, very noticeable. So I might start to, for purposes of study, um, you can see the Old West End is, is the neighborhood that I live in. Uh, and then that jurisdiction extends probably, I believe, to Walnut Street. But the text, of course, is, is ostensibly large at this point. Um, so I will turn off the Muncie neighborhood boundaries and the map will re regenerate. But we'll go into a portion of the corridor that you're interested in. It takes a, takes a few moments for the map to regenerate, so we'll let that go for a moment and I'll see how you're doing.
Okay, so center the map where you want it to be centered. Um, of course, there's lots of different parts. I mean, this when you click on any property in Beacon, you can it'll give you, it'll connect you to the property records. So if it has a historic registered nomination or anything like that, it should be linked, which is great. Uh, I don't want that to be highlighted though, so I need to click on something else. Remove the tag. Turn off the results, and then center that. Get it. Get close. Don't get too close. All right. Don't get this close, <laughs> but get close. And on the top row here are three buttons. One is to save the image. So if you just download the map image as a PNG or as a JPEG, just to give you an idea of what that looks like, that's tempting, but it's missing some information. It's missing a scale bar. It's not there. It ain't there. So that's a problem, <laughs> okay? Because potentially we wouldn't be able to scale the map in future software. Um, but it is nice just to have the image. So I'll just save that. It is, that is 2019 imagery. So that's already saved. So I go back to Beacon. Instead, I'm going to do what's called print setup. Print setup will fix a real scale to a real sheet of paper. Uh -huh. okay. So it might be a very relative scale. You know, I, our engineering scales only have so many scales on them. But if we were to pick, in this case, an 11 by 17 landscape and pick high resolution and pick, say, one inch equals 100 feet, Beacon will fix that scale to what fits into a 11 by 17 map at that particular moment. And then I'm going to turn off header, overview, title, legend. I'm going to turn all that off except for north, north arrow and scale bar. Turn all of that off except for the north arrow and the scale bar. And then print as PDF. Beacon will then create a map based on this criteria as a PDF that you can download and then we'll use. It'll take a moment. We'll give the server a workout. So all of this criteria on the left-hand side here determines what this map is. So we don't need any of the parts on the right hand side that can be removed. And then at the very bottom, we see a 2019 map on top of the people tag. Okay, so turn off most of this, except for maybe major roads. We have parts to do with people that are not on the right hand side. Okay, the map is prepared. Let's look at it. Aha, it has what I want. It has a scale bar, one inch to 100 foot attached to the image. Now the image is something we can bring into other software and scale the map so it fits the paper, and we can bring it into SketchUp and we can start building on it, and then we'll be in sync. Good thing to have. It's a feature that does not exist when you just download the image. I've got the search history for build. And depending on your browser, um, your browser, if you float over your browser window, it, it'll, it'll give you a download symbol, or you might, some of you might have to do a right click. I'm struggling with this yesterday, but however you down, choose to download it, that is a PDF that is prepared for download now. We have an image now. So whether it's a JPEG or whatever it is, PDF, you go to File, Place,
And I've put those boundaries there. That that box might be comfortable for you, may not. Just you know, feel free to, to, to delete it if you don't want it. That's the wrong one. <laughs> Find it now. Map one. So you can place either a PDF or a JPEG or any other image. Bring it in here, and the scale bar is vis <coughs> is visible. So this bar scale that I have, we might. You can customize that now based on the scale of the map image that you brought in. So you can modify that bar scale based on what what is visible here in the corner relative to the map or you can just delete the bar scale and say you know what that's enough <laughs> that's enough for me <laughs> you know uh, there is there is a north arrow in here in yours um, so if, to avoid replication just know that every map that you ever make should have at minimum two cross streets a north arrow bar scale of some kind. To avoid the map jumping around as we work on it now, I like to click on it, then I go to Object, and then Lock Selection. That will take the base map image and will lock it so that it doesn't move around as we start to do stuff on top of it. Okay. Go to Window Layers. And that'll start the layers menu, make that visible for you. We've got the base image now on layer one. And you can just delete any of the, just delete layers that aren't relevant. But I think label symbols, title block, those are layers that we have placed above layer one, which will make this relevant for us. Okay. That is now locked. If I unlock it, then I can manipulate the image again. And you can see that opacity is something I can control. So maybe the aerial image isn't as, 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 there's a lot of contrast and detail to it. I can change the opacity of that image. Sometimes when we build information on top of an image, we don't want the full contrast. We want more of a ghosted version. And some people ghost their X, but you can ghost an image. I got a great laugh with the undergraduates yesterday. Another way to do this is to place a white box over the whole map. That's a black box, but I just make a white box by clicking the fill color and then change the opacity of that. It's another way to put a ghost over an image like so. Just to, just to change the contrast of the image so it's not overpowering. Anything that you print is going to come out darker and have more color than what you can see on the screen. So just play with that right now. You have, you have to unlock the image again to try to change its opacity. Yeah. Window, workspace. Printing, painting is a good workspace. It'll make a lot of these default tools appear on your your upper horizontal row as well as your right plane. It's a good workspace to be running. Because a lot of our uh, stroke menus and our color menus will appear at this point. As well as opacity. That's that's that sliding scale I'm making up here appears when you have this uh, window workspace painting tool painting workspace uh, activated. Okay, any questions about that? No? Okay. Let's go back to layers. We, we may, the layers appear here in the lower right. So I'll start dropping. Let's see here. No. We downloaded some arrows. I already well, I already put them on my desktop. So there's a few arrows here. Medium arrow, thick white arrow. Let's, I'm going to pick medium arrow PNG. That's going to drop it in there. That's, that's a gray arrow. I can change the size like this. This is an image, so 
it, it will run, it'll, it, it'll squish like this. You can squish it like that. This is my squishy. This is what I will call my, my squishy. That's, that's an image. Um, a different version it would be, that's a PNG, that's a portable network graphic. An SVG is a simplified vector graphic. That is the language of Illustrator. You'll see an arrow, arrow that looks kind of like this, but it will, it will, it will open by, by itself in its own window. I can edit, cut that away, and paste it in front, and it will appear on the Illustrator board like this, and I can rotate it, and then I can tell it what, what to be. If I have the painting uh, workspace activated, I can, I, can, I can change the fill and the stroke of any simplified vector graphic. Over here on the left is a fill and a stroke selector. You can see a drop-down menu, fill and stroke as well. So if I were to change the fill of this to, say, red, it becomes a very bold red arrow. And I can scale it down. I can squoosh it. I can manipulate it. But this might be the indicator of the station point, origin point, and the direction of a photograph that you have taken. Okay. This is the beginning of a photo inventory. Okay. If I manipulate the stroke of that, it'll create an outline around it. So if I put a black stroke around it and tell that stroke to be four points or 24 points, you can see that that's kind of a bold arrow now. There are two things that we can manipulate with simplified vector graphics, the fill and the stroke. The shortcut is right over here, the fill and the stroke. The drop-down menu, if you have the painting workspace activated, all of that will appear right there. But that, this is the beginning of telling our viewer where a photograph was taken. There are a couple of styles of arrows in there. Pick the one that you like, that suits your fancy, that meets your aesthetic taste. I'll drop in another one. Uh, I've just I, what I've done in the Mac. I can I can drag and drop. <laughs> What, what I recommend you do is file and place. Yeah. And that'll open up a dialog window and you can place it. But the Mac does have that drag and drop. Drag and drop? Drag and drop option. There's a medium arrow white. So for, for our future diagramming, next module. We'll get more into that. But those are some arrows that I've downloaded from, um, from different packs. I believe that's a white arrow. I've downloaded some icons from different makers, illustrator makers, that we'll be using throughout the semester. So. We're going to start making logos and brands and stuff like that for your, for your company. Um, a lot of these are things that I've downloaded and provided for your use. Let's try this arrow, see how it looks. I can paste it in. I can change its fill. I can change its stroke just to make it readable. Okay, pick out. I can change its proportions. To preserve proportions, we hold down the shift key and we can scale things up and down. To manipulate proportions, you can see I can stretch it and bleh, make it look like a lazy K. What's up, man? Peace. But to preserve the proportions of an object, we hold down the shift key as we shift things up and down. So pick an arrow style that you like and try it out, see what it works for you. Here's, here's the Manhattan subway, or sorry, this is the New York subway <laughs> arrow, right? <laughs> that, cl that clear block arrow. But 
there is a criteria that I'm interested in here as well, and that is the ability to float a, a number on this, because you're going to have more than one photograph. Okay? So what I might do is copy and paste this arrow and bring it down and rotate it back down again. Grab a corner and you can rotate it and bring it down here and start to build a legend. Build the legend. So I'm going to use this to start to build a legend. So a red arrow has some sort of meaning to it. Maybe, and, and as you look at the examples that I've zipped up in there, folks have distinguished between historic photographs and modern photographs, right? Yep. Does that make sense to our viewer? Might make sense to our viewer to consider the difference between a historic photograph and a modern photograph. So if I copy and paste this guide and turn it another direction and change its color to something that's readable against the aerial photograph, then we have two distinguishing arrows that might represent two different types of photographs, either historic or modern. I'll copy that, paste, and start to build that as part of the legend. Build the legend. Maybe, I, maybe I'm foolish in thinking that my 70 YouTube subscribers like my jokes, but uh, at any rate, I can still dream. Plus, I need a retirement plan. Okay. Yes. Good. Maybe. All right. Let's float an arrow on top of, of that. So we grab the text tool, and for me, it fills in this gobs of gobs of text. Just just do a one. And then we can pick a font and a size that's appropriate. This is, again, with the painting workspace, a lot of this appears right away in that upper. Oh, see what happened there? Oh, I forgot to lock the map. Oh. I go to Object, Lock, Selection, and it locks it in place. So it doesn't get funky on me. I, I want my text probably to be white. And I can select either regular or bold, depending on the font that I've, I've chosen. I have the ability to select regular or bold. And then I can float it. I can float that text now. Over my arrow, and that indicates photo number one. Okay. Once you have a comfortable number in relationship with an arrow, if I select it from the left, if I make a selection window from the left, or I hold down the shift key, I can make more than one selection. I can object group them together. In Illustrator, that is a great thing now because now this can move around as a group. I can also copy it, copy, paste, and there is a duplicate of it. I can then briefly ungroup it, change the number using the text tool, and I have my second number. Grab the pointer again, select the number and the arrow, and then group it again. All right, in addition to this photo inventory, which you can identify historic photographs and your modern photographs, let's create a boundary that might replicate your study area. So let's go to the pen tool 
and we're going to make a compound pass. Now, I'm going to turn down the opacity right away because it's going to cover up stuff. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to turn down the opacity right away. And then using the pen tool, I can make several points to highlight a portion of the neighborhood. This might be your primary study area. Of where you think you want to make a change. It just gives your viewer an idea of what what the rest of the semester might might start to um, might start to study in greater detail. So that's pretty obnoxious looking, but uh, I can turn down the opacity to about 60 percent, 50 percent, something like that. I can put it on its own layer. So I can, when I, if I want something on a different layer, I can always cut it away, select a different layer, and paste it onto that layer. And you can see it, it'll move underneath the other arrows because the other arrows are on, on the top layer. So this starts to give us the option of highlighting a very specific portion of the map as a, as a way of saying, this is my primary study area. The fill at the moment, as you can see, is, is yellow. We can see that here, and then the painting workspace on the, on the top. Here's some more fun things to do. Um, we can manipulate the stroke. I can bump that up. Like really bold, okay. And then in the stroke menu, which in the painting workspace I, is, is over here on the right, there are things we can do to this, this line. We can cap it or corner it or line it a certain way. That gives the appearance of the caps or corners. We can make it a dashed line and say, I want corners handled a certain way and I want six points of distance in between each dash. So it gives you different character of dash lines to start to say, this is my study area. That, that shape can be tweaked or moved around, adjusted into place, and it lives on, an, on one of the layers. I can, there are other effects that object now, we can apply effects to it. <laughs> Some of these are pretty funky, pretty fantastic. Um, if we go to stylize, put a drop shadow on it, it'll drop a shadow onto the map. There are modes here. Multiply is an interesting mode because it, 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 um, it puts a soft shadow on top of the map. I can apply those things to my arrows as well. I can go to effect, stylize. There's feather, inner glow, outer glow, round corners, scribble. We can start to make them look like objects <laughs> floating over the map. A lot of interesting things here. But sometimes drop shadows make something pop. And make something more readable. So if you've seen some interesting analysis maps or brochures that have these effects, that's, that's all it knows there, right? It, it has all these things loaded to make things visually pop and communicate hierarchy and communicate emphasis. So effect, yep. Uh, stylize, drop shadow. And you can tell it what color the drop shadow is to be. You can change its opacity here. You have control over all those things. All right. So there's a, I've made these in Photoshop, and these are saved as PNG, Portable Network Graphic Files. So you can drop those onto your map as well, if you wish. And we'll use those more uh, in the next module. But if there's an area of emphasis or a landmark or something like that, that this asterisk now will float on top of things. So if there's a landmark or a specific thing, 
you don't like any of those arrows, just want to make your own, um, come, come over to this uh, rectangle tool and underneath it is a line segment tool. And I'll just drag a line segment there, like so. I've got a red color and a stroke weight of 40 already assigned to it, like so. And then under the stroke menu, that's again, we can make that a dashed line or, or an undashed line. I have to move some stuff out of the way here before I go to window stroke to pull up the entire stroke menu. Come on, move the color guide away, show options. Come on. We can actually add arrowheads to any line segment. So I can add one of these arrowheads, arrow 11, turn it down 50%, 50%. So you can actually make your own arrowheads just with the line segment. That's another option for you. As opposed to downloading. Is that with the line segment tool? That is with the line segment tool. It is embed, embedded, <laughs> embedded under the rectangle tool. So just the line segment. And I can tell it to be a certain stroke weight. I can tell it under the stroke menu to be a dash or a solid. I can tell it to have a certain arrowhead. <laughs> and I change the proportions of the arrowhead. Sound effects optional. Uh, there. Okay. That will be really helpful for us in the next module when we start to do more line segments. Different line segments uh, with different behaviors associated with those. For curved lines, I like the paintbrush tool. Paint, the paintbrush tool has a little more freedom to it. Like, like so. And what's cool about that is uh, Illustrator will, will smooth it out for you. And then you can add a stroke weight to it. Try that. And then you have to tell it what kind of cap to have, right? So it have, does it have a round cap? Does it have an, uh, a flat cap in the stroke menu? What kind of end cap do you want it to have? I can, this is fun, I can take an arrowhead and I can marry it to a curved line. I select the line and the arrowhead and then I go object path join. <laughs> it obliterated the arrowhead though. Hmm. Uh, so I just maybe have to add the arrowhead back to it. Or sometimes what I'll do, I'll, I'll just take, I'll take an extension, I'll take the line segment off of this curved line and make that an arrowhead. Sometimes I, I just, sometimes it's only two, it remains two objects but you can float them together, uniform basic, and, and put an arrowhead on that. That'll be helpful <laughs> in diagramming stuff later. Why? Because roads and rivers are not straight. They are curvilinear, and so it may be helpful in future diagramming to have the ability to put emphasis for a roadway or a, a river uh, with a curvilinear line. So we'll see more of that next module. Sneak preview of next module. We'll do more of that next next week after the module one is due. Okay, but that what's on screen right uh, right there is enough for this first modules of math. This key map will accompany your photographs and your Word document to help your viewer understand where your historic photographs may have originated and where your photographs originated. It allows your reader to read through your document, compare and contrast the historic and modern imagery, and be able to 